All right, so we plugged in two, negative two. Let's we'll see what works out. So two cubed, two times two times two is eight. Two squared, two times two is four. Two times four is eight. Eight plus eight, 16 plus one is 17. Now the other side, negative two cubed. Since it's, since it's an odd exponent, we know it's gonna be negative. Two cubed is eight. Negative two squared, since it's even exponent, that'll make it positive inside the parentheses. So two squared is four. They're both positive, positive, positive is positive. Two times four is eight. One. Those cancel, so it's one. So since they're not equal, this equation is neither even nor odd. It's neither. So that's what we're looking at for symmetry is if I change the X values from positive to negative, will it change the Y values? If it remains positive, if I have a function and it gives me the same answer as if I put the negative X in there, we call that an even function. If I have a function and I put a negative number in there and it just, just makes the same number of different signs, we call that an odd function. All right, so that's, that's symmetry. Now, with, with what I started off talking about here for symmetry, you have a point. If it's across the x-axis, what changes? Only x, x's change. And the only change are sign. Okay. So I start off with two, one here. That's my original point. If I flip it across the y axis, the x changes sign. Because if I go this yeah. way, the only thing changes are the x values. The y stays the same. And that's called an even function. If I start off with a point two, one, and I flip it across the x axis, it's a vertical uh, reflection then only y values change. It's not even the y values, it's the, the sine of y and the sine of x. And if it's across the origin, both x and y change signs. All right, that's symmetry. All right, so what we're looking at is what the graph's gonna look like. Okay, now let me give you a picture and you tell me if it's symmetric about the x-axis or the y-axis or neither.
Okay, so you're top three. The first one, let me ask you, is it a function? No, because it, va it fails the vertical line test. Is it odd? What does odd mean? Odd means it, it, it flips across the origin. And there's this point and that point. It's, it's supposed to be a circle. This is an odd function because this point here has a mirror image over here. This point here has a mirror image there. Every point has a mirror image. So I flip down and over. So it's an odd function. An odd function means it flips both X and Y axis. Because it has to flip down and it has to flip, flip over. Or it can flip over and then flip down. So that's what an odd function is. How about the first, the second one, the, the y equals x squared, the parabola? Is that symmetric about anything? The x-axis? The y, yes. This is so it's symmetric about the y-axis. So is it odd or even? This isn't even, right? Because the only thing that changes are the x values. The y values stay the same. The third graph is a graph of the absolute value function. Is this symmetric about anything? Yeah, it's symmetric about the y-axis again. Because if this is one, then this has to be negative one. So it's an even function because it flips across the y-axis. All right, the next one, a diagonal line. Neither. Remember, okay, to be odd, what does it need? Negative and positive results. Right, it has to have a flip on the x-axis and a flip on the y-axis mm -hmm. or flip across the y-axis and down. So in other words, if it's symmetric about the origin, then it's odd. Is that line symmetric? Yes. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's a trick question. Because is it across, this one goes through the origin. Right. Does this one? No. So it can't be symmetric about the origin. Oh. Because in, if it was symmetric about the origin, these points would have points over here. So. This, ex this example is odd, this is neither. And this last one, hyperbola. Is it symmetric? Not a, yeah, not a function. It's not a function, it's neither, mm -hmm. but it is symmetric about the x-axis.
because for any one X you give me, I have two values of Y. Let's talk about functions. Let's, let's talk about the library because how many of y'all have, have seen any of these functions before? Okay. Let's look at the library of functions. And I'll give you those that sheet next week. So let's so we're just gonna draw eight nine eight or ten spaces. Let's we'll call this the library of functions. The first function is called a constant function. For example, f of x equals three. It's a constant, it doesn't change. So that graph will be a horizontal line. The domain, the domain has to do with the x-axis and the range with the y-axis. What's my domain here? All real number, yeah. Negative infinity, positive, very good. So, or you could just put the all real number symbol. Either or. Because I can use negative X's, I can use zero, I can use positive X's. So I can use all the X's. So my domain are all real numbers. The range, it's only whatever the constant number is. Whatever the constant number is, it's a horizontal line. This one's called a linear equation. It's a linear equation because the graph is going to be a line. How do I know it's a linear equation? There's no special operations around it. There's no exponent. X is not on the bottom of a fraction. So the graph of this, when x is one, y is one. When x is negative one, y is negative one. And, and so on and so forth. It's a 45 degree angle line. The domain of this one is what? What are my possible x values? The number. same negative infinity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I can use any negative number or any positive numbers, it's N zero. How about the range? It changes, so it would no, be- because think no. of this way. If I use negative infinity here, it's gonna to go to po negative infinity. If I use positive 100, it's gonna be 100. So it's gonna be the same thing. Oh. Because this, this arrow and this line tells you it goes on forever and ever, ever. It matches all the y values, it matches all the x values, so it goes on forever, so it's all real numbers. Next one, f of x equals x squared. This is called a quadratic equation. It's called a quadratic because it has a power two.
the graph of a quadratic equation is the u. It only touches the y at the x-axis at zero. It's called the vertex. The lowest point is called the vertex. The domain of this function Yeah, all real numbers. Basically, to answer your question there is, are there any restrictions that I could put in there? Can X be negative? Can X be positive? Can X be zero? If you could put anything in there, it's all real numbers. How about the range? What are the possible Y values? All, all real numbers? And I can't be negative. Oh. So the smallest it could be is zero, and it can go up from there. So y is greater than or equal to zero. Or I could put the interval notation, zero comma infinity. Okay, now this is called a cubic. F of x equals x cubed. It's called a cubic. Basically, the difference between a cubic and a quadratic is whenever you have an even exponent, it'll make any number positive. That's since under it. Negative two times negative two is positive four. But if I have an odd exponent, my if I put a negative number in there, the answer is going to be negative. If I put a positive, it'll stay positive. So basically, I just took this left side and cranked it down. That's what that looks like. And we're going to look at some uh, another set of equations like that. We'll talk about those in a second. The fifth equation, the square root of x. Mm, we have the domain range. Yeah, both of these are all real numbers because it goes on forever, both directions. Okay, this is called a square root function. A square root radical. What are the rules about square roots? Can you take a square root of a negative number? No, because whatever number is inside there, you have to be able to multiply the same number twice to get that number. Like square root of four is two because two times two is four. Square root of 16 is four, plus four times four is 16. But if I had square root of negative nine, Negative three times negative three is a positive nine. So you can't have negatives. So no negatives. Can it be zero? Square root of zero is zero. And it can be positive. So since it can't be negative, it could be zero. Square root of one is what? One. Square root of four. There's a dot there. 
square root of nine. Three. It's three. So you see how far it goes out before it goes up one? This is a very slight curve. Mm -hmm. But it cannot be negative. And the answer cannot be negative. So what's the domain? Zero. X is greater than or equal to zero or zero to infinity. And the range, the lowest it can go is zero and then it goes up. So Y is greater than or equal to zero or zero to infinity. The next one is called a cube root. Radical. Now, in a square root, there's an invisible two here. That's why you need two of a kind. In this one, you need three of a kind to take it out of the radical. So since it's an odd root, our answers can be positive, negatives, and zero. So there's a graph. The domain and the range are the same. It's all real numbers. So far so good? Because I'm gonna ask you all to memorize these symbols, the, these functions, because the faster you memorize them, the easier the rest of this course is gonna be. All right, now those are the radicals. Now let's look at the rationals. One over X. It's called a rational equation. Now, do we have any restrictions on X here? Can X be negative? One over negative one is negative one. So the bottom can be negative. Can it be zero? No. So we cannot use zero. So X in this case cannot equal zero. We have restrictions. So anytime you have X on the bottom, you have a restriction because the bottom can never equal zero. And we call that an asymptote. An asymptote is simply a vertical line that the graph cannot cross because it'll make the denominator zero. A vertical asymptote. If, we, if x is zero, it's undefined. We can't use that. So the basically, the bigger the bottom number becomes, what happens to the overall number? The bigger x gets, what happens to the number one over x? It gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So that means the closer it gets to zero, it gets bigger. And the farther it gets from zero, it goes to zero. It goes very close to zero. Likewise, in the negative realm. 
but it stays in the negative quadrant. What's my domain? To where? To zero. Yeah, you, you can say that just X can equal zero. Or if you want to do that, you can go negative infinity to zero, union zero to positive infinity. You could do that. Or you say that X cannot equal zero. Now, can one over X ever equal zero? How can a fraction equal zero? The only way a fraction can equal zero is if the top is zero. Can the top ever become zero if it's one over X? No. So it'll never equal zero. So y can never equal zero. So that's it for that one. Rational squared. So what can you tell me about this graph by looking at the equation? Do we have any asymptotes? Remember, the asymptote is what are the x values that make the bottom number equal zero? So if x is zero, the bottom zero, you can't have that. So x cannot equal zero. That's your asymptote, your vertical asymptote. So since X can equal zero, we get the same thing here. When X gets bigger, the number gets smaller. So on the positive side, it looks like that. It just grows a lot faster. How about the negative side? If we put a negative in there and square it, what happens to it? It'll be positive. positive. Yeah, so this side of the graph looks like this. Kind of looks like the, like the Atari symbol. It'll never cross the y-axis because the top can never equal zero. What's the domain? Negative infinity um, to zero, union yes. zero yes. to negative to infinity. Very good. Or X just can't equal zero, right? Both of them work. Very good. How about the range? Very good. Um, infinity to Y is greater than zero or parenthesis zero to infinity.
Well, that's the absolute value of X. So what does the absolute value tell us? The absolute it's always positive? It's always in positive, yeah. It, it tells us the distance between two things, between a number and zero. So the absolute value tells us the distance a number is from zero. And that's a positive number because there is no negative or positive distance. It's just a length. Can you put negatives inside there? No. Yeah, you can. Absolute value of negative three is three. Three. Okay. So you can put you can put negative numbers inside there. Mm -hmm. Can you put zero inside there? Yeah. And you can put positive numbers inside there. Absolute value of three is three. It just, what it does, it takes whatever number, not an equation, but number, and makes it positive inside there. So when X is zero, Y is zero. When X is one, Y is one. When X is two, Y is two. When X is negative one, Y is one. When X is negative two, Y is two. So you have two linear equations there. How about the domain and range? What's my domain? Can I use negative numbers? Yes. Yes. Can I use zero? No. It's part of the graph. Oh, yeah. Absolute value of zero, zero. Can I use positives? Yeah. So this is all yes. real numbers for the domain. Negative infinity, positive infinity. How about the range? Very good. Y is greater than or equal to zero. This is low as it can go for bracket zero infinity. And the last one we're going to talk about, because the, the, la, the other two we're going to talk about later on in chapter six, exponentials and logarithmic. This is called the greatest integer function, the greatest integer function. In other, in other words, what it means, it truncates the negative values. I mean, the, the decimals, not negatives. It truncates the negative, the, the decimal values. So you always have just a number that's in front. So for example, when X is zero, the equation is zero. If I had 0 0.1 and I get rid of the decimal, I get zero. If I get 0 0.9, I get zero because I drop the decimals. At 1.0, what happens?
it becomes one. So it stops at one and jumps up to one. So it goes all the way to two and it jumps to two. And so on and so forth. And likewise, on the other side, on the negative side, zero, negative 0 0.3 drops to 0 0.3, so it's negative 0, all the way to 1. At 1, it drops down, all the way to 2, then it drops down. What does that look like? This is called the stair step function. But it looks like a bunch of stairs, steps. It's called a stair step function. The domain, can you guess what the domain's gonna be? Very good. It will be all real numbers because you never have an open space. When it goes to one negative one, it jumps from negative one or negative two, negative one. And so on and so forth. So you never have any openings. How about the range? That Z stands for integers. The range are only the integers from negative infinity to positive infinities, no decimals. And that's what that Z stands for. So this is the library of functions. Well, until we do logarithms and exponents, but almost every equation you'll ever see starts off with one of these. So the sooner we can memorize these, the better, easier everything else will be. Oh, everybody okay with this? I'm going to want you guys eventually to get to a point no matter what kind of equation I gives you you can tell me the basic shape of it you can tell me the shape of it by only looking at the beginning and the last terms, the first and last terms. The number at the back is called the constant. It doesn't have a variable letter X, so what's all, what's the constant always going to represent? The y-axis? The y-intercept, yes. It's the y-intercept. So we know already in this first graph, it's going to cross through 1 on the y-axis. It's a lot more we knew than five minutes ago. It's a quadratic. What's that? Quadratic. This the first one is a quadratic. Yes, we know it's quadratic because there's a two. 
Now, okay, I'm going to say that. Because it's a quadratic, it tells us a whole series, a whole story. But this first one, we call this the leading term. The leading term gives us a lot of information about the graph. So this whole thing is called the leading term. The two is called the leading coefficient. The square, the power, tells us it's called a degree. So let's only look at the leading term. Let's see what it tells us and how we interpret it. The leading term. So it's a two X squared here and the X cubed there. The leading coefficient is A. It's whatever is in front of the X is my leading coefficient. This tells us the direction. and the vertical shape of the graph. Basically, is it gonna be tall or short? If it's tall, it's gonna be spread out. If it's short, it's gonna be scrunched. The degree N the degree tells us a lot more. Number of possible solutions. number of x intercepts or a possible number of x intercepts the shape of the curve and it tells us what happens at both ends of the graph. That is called N behavior. The degree n, number of possible solutions, possible numbers of x-intercepts, the shape of the curve, and what happens at both ends.
it can all be narrowed down into this little picture right here. Here, n is even, n is odd, a is positive, a is negative. All right. We're going to get the n behavior. So if a is positive and n is even, what that's telling us is that both ends will point up. We don't know what happens in the middle just yet. If n, if the degree is odd and a is leading term is positive. Both ends point different directions. Again, we don't know what happens in the middle. If A is negative and N is even, both ends will point down. We don't know what happens in the middle. If A is negative and N is odd, the left side points up and the right side points down. All right, so that's one thing. This tells us the end behavior, what the basic shape of the curve is going to be. So with that, let's look at the first example. So what can you tell me that graph is going to look like approximately? We know it crosses the y-axis at one. Since it's an even. even degree, that means both ends point the same direction. Up. They both, why are they up? Because this number here is positive. It's bigger, yeah, it's positive. It's, po it's greater than zero. So let's see here. Now, is it going to be on this side or is it going to be on this side? Mm. Let's see. Let's plug in a value one. So two minus three is negative one, one. So it's right here. So it'll look something like this. Because if I put one inside the equation, two minus three plus one equals zero. So the graph will look something like this. It looks something like this. Okay, how about the next one we had up there? What do we know about that one? Mm. 
that's an odd positive number for the uh, leading term. Right, okay. So we know the leading term, it has a one here, one's greater than zero, and it's an odd degree. So what does that tell me? It's bigger than zero. Right, it's one's bigger than zero. And um, it's pointing in different directions. It, yep, because of this, it's pointing in different directions. Since the leading term is positive, we know that this side goes down and this mm -hmm. side goes up. And the y-intercept is three. Very good. The graph okay. can look something like this. Why do I think it looks something like that? Is because the degree tells us the maximum number of X intercepts. X intercepts are also called solutions. So since the degree is three, it's telling me I can have at most three x-intercepts. The number of vertices, what is a vertex? What is a vertice? What's a vertex? Hmm. It's the highest or lowest point on a curve. You're not going to, when you're on a roller coaster, the point where the roller coaster doesn't move, doesn't go up or down, it's that's the, those are the vertices. Those are the vertices. So the number of vertices will always be, well, usually be one less than a degree or one less. than the number of solutions. The number of, degree, of vertices will be always be one less than the number of solutions. It's typically the number of the degrees of minus one. So again, the degree is the exponent. It tells us the maximum number of x-intercepts. Those are also called solutions. And the number of vertices we're gonna have is one less than the degree. And that's exactly what we have here. Since our, the second equation was a cubic function, we have three solutions. If we have three solutions, then we have two vertices. Likewise, in the first one, the degree is two. So we'll have two solutions and only one vertex. Two minus one. Why do I, why do I say maximum number of solutions or intercepts? So the degree n equals the maximum number of solutions possible.
So let's let's think of the e, the basic one. When x equals one or n equals one, what kind of equation is that? Remember, this is your degree. The same value of x. Yep. It's a value of x. So it's a straight line. Remember, the degree tells us the number of intercepts we can have. There's one solution, one x intercept. And one minus one is zero, so it has no vertices. If n equals two, then there are three possibilities. It says that we're gonna have at most two solutions and we're gonna have one vertex because it's two minus one. So let's look at this. The graph can look like this, like this, and like this. So how many solutions are here in this first picture? Two solutions. And the next one? One. Only, only one. And the last one? No solutions. Let's look at the next one. Let's look at n equals three. Y equals X cubed. We have three possibilities. Those are our three possibilities. Because n is three, the, x, the, the degree is three, I can have at most three solutions, which means I have two vertices. Or I can have two solutions. Or I can have one solution. I can't go any further than that. So what do we notice about the odd and even degrees and number of solutions? If the degree is even, at most, You can have n number of solutions. Or you can go down to zero solutions. This is if it's even. Now, 
when I say when I say zero solutions, it doesn't mean you're getting answers, but it means you'll have no real solutions. You will have answers, but they'll be imaginary. You're gonna have numbers that are really weird, which we'll get to next chapter. So if the degree is even, you can have at most n all the way down to zero solutions. If it's odd, at most you can have n solutions. But you have to have at least how many? Three. Oh, one. Oh, sorry. At least. At least one, yeah. You must have at least one solution. Why? Why is it one solution? Well, the line has to cross the x-axis at one point, at least one point. Why? It has to, but why? Think of the end behavior. The end behavior of even degrees is they either both point up or they both point down. They both point the same direction. Right. So if the x-axis is, is below that, they'll never touch. That's why you have zero. But odd, odd degrees, the end behavior, they point different directions. So one of those sides has to at least cross the x-axis once. And you can have, you can you can have a function that looks like this, but it has to have one x. If it's an odd degree, it has to have one x-intercept because both ends point different directions. So far, so good. Let me give you one. Just rough sketch what this graph may look like. The only thing we know for sure is what? The y-axis, the six. The y, yeah, the y-intercept. That's the only thing we know for sure. There's another thing we do know for sure. Well, the term is uh, even number, the primary term. Yeah, the, the degree is even. Mm -hmm. The leading term. Well, the leading term, of, yeah, that's the leading term, this leading coefficient. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if that's, that's odd or even, doesn't matter that. It just yeah. matters that it's positive. The leading term, or the leading coefficient is positive and it's even, so what does that mean? You have the sketch going up above the x-axis. Yeah, both ends will point up. Because since the degree is even, we know point the same directions. 
since the coefficient is positive, it points up. If it was negative, it would point down below the x-axis. At most, how many x-intercepts? Six. The degree tells you how many x-intercepts. So let's say there's an x-intercept there, there, there. So we can have a graph like this. But the only thing we know for sure are the end, how they look, and the y, the y intercept. Believe it or not, in chapter four, you're going to solve this equation. You're going to tell me all the x-intercepts, whether they're imaginary, whether they're real. You're going to tell me how many vertices we're going to have. So. Pretty cool. So that's that's what we're gonna do in that. All right, so that that's what we have to do about what the important parts of a function are. We we talked a little bit about symmetry earlier in the beginning of class. Symmetry simply means the mirror image. About the y-axis. About the x-axis. And about the origin. When, when I say about about the, I'm saying if you're saying I'm flipping across the, flipping across the y-axis, flipping across the x-axis, flipping across the origin. So earlier I had the point two one. That's my original point. It's at two one. If I flip it across the y-axis, what's the mirror image? What's the what's the mirror point across the y-axis? Here's one to negative two. Yeah, it, it'll be negative two, one. Because when you flip across the y-axis, change the sign of x. That's that's all it tells me. If, if it's moving horizontally. That's across the y-axis. So that's that one. Only thing changes are the x values. If I change, if I flip across the x-axis, if I flip across the x-axis, what changes? Does this does the sign of x change? No. Yeah. Here you change the sign of y. So it would be two, negative one. Mm -hmm. And across the origin, that's, you change both. So it'd be negative two, negative one.
because what it, what across the origin actually does is you flip across the x, then the y, or you flip across the y, then the x. In other words, you, you negate both of those. All right. And as we talked about earlier, we have odd and even functions. An even function flips across the y-axis. An odd function flips across both x and y. Any questions so far? Let's look at, there's a shortcut. Because if, you, if you're asked, is the function odd, even, or neither? Let's look at these, the first one. F of X equals X squared. Is that odd, even, or neither? The way you test it, If you put a negative value in, the, if you put a positive value and a negative value in there and they both equal, then it's even. No, it means nothing changes. If you put a negative value inside there and it turns out you have the same numbers but different signs, then it's odd. Anything else is neither. So let's look at this. Here's x equals 2, x equals negative 2. So that's the way I test it. I have to have the same number, but different signs. Whenever you substitute something, always put it inside parentheses. 2 squared is 4. Negative two times negative two is positive four. Since those are equal, this is an even function. How about x cubed? Is it odd, even, or neither? First, you have, first thing you have to do is just pick a number and plug it in there, see what happens. Positive and negative, that number. And just plug it in place of X inside the function. Two cubed, two times two times two is eight. Negative two, negative two, negative two. One, two. Since I have an odd number of negatives, it's negative. Two, four, eight. The answer is negative eight. So what does that tell us? It's odd. 
because I have the same number. They're both eights. One's positive, one's negative, so it's odd. How about a constant function? Is it odd, even, or neither? Neither. Ooh, what? how did you test that answer? Because it doesn't have, well, it's constant because it doesn't, it's not going to go through the x axis. Well, okay, let's just see. Let's say we pick a value for x. Let's say 2 and negative 2 again. Okay. If I put negative or 2 in there, what happens? Does this number change? No. No. I put negative 2 in there. Does it change? No. So they're equal. Even though I put positive and negative numbers in there, it's equal. So this is an even number. Even oh, function. okay. Because think about it. If you think about it, the graph is a horizontal line. It flips across the y-axis. That's why it's even. If it flips across the y-axis, if it's a mirror image across the y-axis, then it's even. That was a trick question. <laughs> So we have three more to test. How about that one? Right, so we do the same test. X equals two. X equals negative two. So we have two squared plus three. Negative it's two squared. Even. Yes. So negative two squared is four. Seven equals seven. So it's even. Very good. Let's do the next one. This is number five. F of x equals x cubed plus You can pick whatever number you want. I just like two for some reason. So two cubed, two times two times two is eight. Eight plus three is 11. Negative two cubed, since it's an odd number, the answer would be negative. Negative, negative, negative makes a negative. Two cubed is eight plus three. Eight's bigger, it's negative. Eight minus three is five. Since 11 doesn't equal negative five or they're not opposite sides, it's neither. All right, how about this next one? X cubed plus X squared.
It's neither, I guess. Well, that's fine. Two cubed is eight. Two squared is four. It's 12. Negative two cubed is negative, negative eight. Two. Negative two squared is positive four. four. Eight squared and four, so it's negative, negative four. So it's neither. Okay. Let's look at Let's look at these last two. X to the fifth minus X cubed plus X, X to the fourth plus three X plus two. So x equals two, we have two to the fifth minus two to the third plus two. Negative two to the fifth minus negative two to the third plus negative two. Two to the fifth. 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. Okay. 2 to the third is 8. That's 2. 32 minus 8 is 24. It's 26. Negative 2 to the fifth can be negative. Two to the fifth is 32. Negative two cubed is negative eight, so it's minus negative eight. Plus or minus is a minus, so that's gonna be a plus. Negative 32, this is negative. 32 minus eight is 24, plus two is 26. So what does that tell us? The odd number? It's, I mean, it's an odd. It's an odd number, very good. Yes, because you have the same number, 26. One's positive, one's negative, so it's odd. And then the last one. Two to the fourth, two, four, eight, sixteen. Two squared is four. Three times four is twelve. Twenty-eight. Thirty. So this is negative two to the fourth, so it should be positive 16. Negative two squared is positive four. 16 oh. plus 12 plus 12 is 30. Even, yeah. Okay, now why did I go through those eight different types of problems? I did that to give you all a shortcut. Let's look at these. We know if the only thing, 
is an even exponent, it's even. If it's an odd exponent, it's odd. If it's a constant, it's also even because it never changes. So out of these first three, which ones can go together? The first and the third. Yeah. So if, if your equation has only even exponents, then it's even. If your equation has only odd exponents, then it's odd. If your equation has even and constants, then it's even. But if it has an odd exponent and a constant, it is neither. In other words, the only people that could match, pair up with the constant are the evens. And that's what we did here in the next one. X squared, that's an even with a constant, so it's an even. Right. The next one, X cubed, that's odd. Odd and even doesn't match, so it's neither. Wow. You can't have them mixed, uh, odd and even, neither. These are all odd. What's this power? To the one. one. Yeah, so it's five, three, one. Those are all odd exponents. So they're all odd. All even mm -hmm. and a constant, gonna be even. even. So that's shortcut you could do for it. That's amazing. I know. <laughs> <laughs> It'll save you from doing the work. Okay, let's go ahead and do the last thing of the chapter. Transformations. Now. Now, the transformations, you have to know the original, you have to know the library of functions. For example, oh, every equation is gonna have this configuration. I'll, I'll call this G. What we're going to be looking at these four letters, A, B, C, and D, and see what they do. Let's look at the first one. Let's look at horizontal shifts. In other words, that's either left or right shift. Here's our first example. What you have to do is you have to break it down to its original. So here are the steps. Find the function in the library of functions. So what's what function would this match to in the library of functions? The easiest way to do that, because in the library of functions, we have x and everything else around it. So that plus three, if we get rid of the plus three, what do we have left? X. X squared. Because here's the X and there's a square. So if I get rid of that three, I have just a function X squared. We know what that graph looks like. That's the parabola, the u shape thing. Okay. 
Can I ask how you know? Is the graph or? Yes, for the graph. How do you know that's how? Uh... That's what we did. Look at, look at when I did all those pictures earlier. Okay. Let me look right here. When we did quadratic equations, if it's x squared, then it has that shape. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. Yes. And again, like we just talked about, since it has a power two, and here's the x inside the parentheses, that means we're gonna have at most two, two solutions. And the only, only one that has two solutions is the u, that u shape. Now, the second step, set inside parentheses equal to zero and solve. So we have x plus three equals zero, subtract three, x equals negative three. That is your horizontal shift. What we're doing in these transformations, all we're doing is we're finding a new place for the origin. So here's the origin. Since we found this in our second step, In other words, this is my new origin. So it means the graph shifted three spaces to the left. Since it happened inside the parentheses, that's a horizontal shift. In, inside the function, I should say. The function is x squared. It I changed the x first before I squared it. So it's a horizontal shift. Hmm. Let's take another one. So what, what's the function from the library? If you get rid of the number, what do you absolute have? Absolute value? The absolute value of X, right. Yes. The function is the absolute value. So now here, X is being changed. So that means it's a horizontal shift. Set inside the operation equals zero and solve for X. This is your horizontal shift. So the original graph was like this. That's that one. This one says, I now have to move the origin to two. So from here, I got to bounce it to two. The graph remains the same. There's a new graph. So if it happens inside the operation, the absolute values, the square root or anything else, then it's a horizontal shift.
So what's the original function? The cube root. The cube root of x, very good. And what does that graph look like? It's actually curved. Yeah, it's like a sideward side S, like a mm -hmm. snake. Solve inside the print the at the operation. So that means now my new origin is at negative two. So there's my new origin. The graph looks the same. It's just that only thing changed is the origin. It's like you cut and paste this picture and moved it two to the left. Remember when we did circles and we looked for the HK values, look for the center? Same thing here. If you look at all of these, if it's X plus three, chain, take the opposite sign, the answer is negative three. That's the shift. If it's X minus two, opposite sign, the answer is positive two. So I shifted to the right two spaces. The last one, x plus two, opposite is negative two, so I shift to the left. So you could use that shortcut if you want to, or you could set it equal zero, but it's a lot easier if you do it that way. So that's a horizontal shift. It happens inside the function. Next, we have a vertical shift. Vertical shifts happen outside the function. If it's positive, it goes up. If it's negative, it goes down. D units. How about that? What's the original function? X squared. It's just the X part. So we know that this is X squared from a library function is that. Is there a horizontal shift? No. Is there anything affecting the X first before you square it? No. So now we look at the vertical shift, negative three. So that means the entire graph goes down to negative three. How about that one? One over x squared plus two. Oh. I always <laughs> hated these. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, again, it's the fraction, so we use a lot of these. Is there a horizontal shift? No, do you see x is inside a parenthesis or anything that has a plus or minus after it? No, so there's no mm -hmm. horizontal shift. 
This is outside the function. The function is right here. This is outside, so it's a vertical shift. So what does one over x squared look like? Because that it can't be negative. So it's the Atari symbol. And then whatever that graph is, it goes up two spaces. So there's my new origin, shifted up two spaces. The graph looks the same. So far so good? Okay, let's do one where we combine all this stuff and then we'll start looking at reflections. going to be the rational one yes what's that going to look like um, so it's one, one over x one on yes one on the bottom one on the top so the second step is your horizontal shift since x has a plus two next to it we already know it's going to be negative two, but let's work it out because it's opposite signs. So it shifts left two spaces. So there's that graph. There's that graph. And then lastly, we have a vertical shift. We have one over X plus two minus three. So we went over two. Now we have to go down three. So we're over two for that one, down three. So here's our new origin. The graphics the same. Does it make sense? If we do it in pieces, it you shouldn't get messed up. reflections because up until now we've only looked at c and d if it's inside the function it's a horizontal shift if it's outside it's a vertical shift that's all we've done so far now for reflections, we're going to look at the coefficient out in front, the leading, leading coefficient. We have two types. We have a 
vertical reflection We'll make it upside down. How do we make it go up a vertically shift? If we put the negative in front of the function. In other words, if your leading coefficient, if A, is less than zero, the graph flips across the x-axis. So if our leading term, leading coefficient is negative, then we know it flips across the x-axis. So the original function we have here is x squared what that means now is any any x that we have or any answer that we have we simply change its sign now it goes down Negative coefficient makes it go down, positive makes it go up. So there's your graph. Let's look at that. It's looking upside down and now it's gonna look upside as upside up. Well, first off, what's the original function? Oh, um, it's absolute Q. Wait, what's it called? Absolute, absolute value of X. Absolute value of X, yes. Okay, so, and that graph is at V. Then we do inside the function. So what kind of shift happens inside the function? You do a positive instead of a negative. Horizontal shift. Well, no, it's an x plus oh, three. Oh, wait. So, so it's negative. Yeah, so it's wait. a horizontal shift. So we have to shift it to the left three spaces. So there's my new origin. Now with a function, now we have to change directions. Instead of pointing up, the function now points down. Two, three. Because that's what that negative tells me in front. What's the last thing I gotta do? We've done inside, we've done outside. We haven't done the minus two part yet.
So what does that minus two tell me to do? Since it's a minus two, I go down two spaces. So my new origin is right there and there's my graph. So inside here tells me to go back three spaces and down two and then flip it. So far so good. So if it's outside the function, if it's outside the function, then it's a flip across the x-axis. If it's inside the function, if it's inside the function, you flip across the y-axis. If it's outside, you flip across the x-axis. You go up and down. So if the negative is outside the function, flip across the x-axis. If the negative is inside, the function, flip across the y-axis. When I say negative, I mean, if it's inside, it has to be in front of the x. If it's outside, it's, it's outside the entire function. But if it's inside, it has to be in front of the x. So the original function here is the square root of x. The graph from your library chart is that. Now think of this. You cannot have negatives inside square roots, right? So what does X have to be to get rid of that negative? X has to be negative. A negative times a negative becomes a positive. So that's a come, it now flips direction. I can only use negative X's. So that's what, that's what I'm saying is, that's what flip across the Y axis means. There. Negative one over two minus x squared plus one. What's the basic function? Rational squared. Yep, rational squared because x is on the bottom, so it's one over x and it's squared. Very good. And that looks like the Atari symbol because you can't have negative answers. What's the horizontal shift? Take what's inside the function, set it equal to zero. So I add x to both sides. So x equals two. So it shifts to the right two spaces.
what's the next shift I got to do? The plus one in the y axis? Nope. What about the numerator? The, it has a negative. Oh. The numerator has a negative. Negative one. And what does that tell me to do? Since it's negative in front, remember, if it's on top, it could be out in front. It tells me I have to flip my graph across the x-axis. If the x, if the negative is outside, flip across the x-axis. The ne this negative is outside that, so I flip across the x-axis. Inside here is my horizontal shift. This negative tells me to flip across the x-axis. Now my last step tells me to go up one space. So here's my new origin. It's now at. So the graph looks like this. What do y'all think? Each step is you have to look at it separately. Do it piece by piece by piece. First off, you have to determine what is the function you're dealing with. Find where the X is, and is there any parentheses? Are there any parentheses around it, or, or brackets, or anything that tells you the function? If X is on the bottom, it's automatically one over X. There's a squared. That's the graph. Then we got to look at what happens to X. Two minus X. Set that equals zero. That's your horizontal shift. So that's two. Then, right now we're looking for positive or negative. With respect to the function, if it's since it's negative up top here, the whole thing's negative because negative one over x squared is the same thing as negative one over x squared. So that means because it's negative, I got to flip it over. And then I can look at the vertical shift goes up one. Let's do one more, and then we'll finish up this, this chapter on next time. Because we're getting close to being time to go. Now, because the last, the last two sections are with horizontal and vertical shrinks and stretches. Those are four rules in themselves that are pretty complicated. So well, I want to make sure we have lots of time that we'll, we'll do that, and then we'll start chapter three next time. Okay. There. I I I don't need that attachment. There's another one. Negative cube root of one plus x plus two. So it's cube root rat rational. Radical. Radical. <laughs> yeah, rational is fraction. So yes, it's a cube root of x. What does cube root of x look like? That's like a snake, a snake yes. Uh, 
All right. What's the horizontal shift tell me to do? Do I have a horizontal shift? Well, yeah, here's the, here's the function. Take, take what's inside there and set it equal to zero. We'll stay minus one, yeah. Minus one, right. So that means we're gonna to shift to the left one unit. The graph still looks the same. It's just shifted to the left one unit. What's next on our decomposition of the function? The plus two. Nope, we have a negative. Oh. We can't, can't do the plus two until we finish everything on that function. Oh. So we have a radical negative in front of the radical three. Since it's negative, that means I flip across the x-axis. This side goes down, this side goes up. Look like that now. This side goes up, this side goes down. Now, the last step. That's why I could do the plus two. That means go up two spaces. So there's my new X and Y origin. It goes this way. And there's my graph. Do it in pieces. You shouldn't have any trouble with it. Okay, nope. All right, and then we'll finish up this, this chapter next week and start chapter three. Because the sooner we can get to chapter four, that's that's the meat of the course. Then we'll spend more time because that's that's where the most moving parts are. Because yeah, it no matter how much that's why we have chapter seven and eight. Those are our buffer chapters. If we have time, we'll do them. If not, then we won't do them. But definitely we have to go through chapter six. So whatever time we have left. Okay, everybody. Thank That's you. It. Thank you all very much for coming to class today. Thank you, Professor. Have a good day. Have a great yeah, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about last week when somebody was talking and the machine died. Yeah, that's fine. Your... <laughs> no, <it's>, uh, <laughs> because my battery was going dead. <laughs> <laughs> we kind of knew so because you let us know before ahead of time. Yeah. You were like, it's going to yeah, die. My, my, my mouth dropped. Uh-oh. Right, that's okay. <laughs> All right. Y'all have a great week. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.